in many ways the comments that I'm making today as well as the remarks that I'll make tomorrow and I suspect will continue in a more unstructured way on Thursday revolve very much around the subtitle to this session or this series which is to say human needs the market system and social alternatives uh, and I do want to thank uh, in particular uh, Patrick Tatiana and Aisha for uh, all the hospitality they have uh, extended to me in uh, organizing this trip, inviting me, uh, dealing with things like cancelled hotel reservations and uh, shuttling me around by car and so on because uh, this is part of the material social infrastructure that uh, makes these sorts of uh, things possible. So uh, thanks to, uh, to all of you. I'm going... In order to address the question, which I'm going to really turn to tomorrow, of alternatives to the market, I think we need to begin with a discussion of what is happening to the global market system today. This is really nothing original to me. It's a predisposition uh, that one gets from Marx's critique of political economy. The idea that rather than starting by erecting our own fantastic schemes as to how the world might be organized, we begin with what is. We begin with the existing state of affairs, the actual conditions of life, social relations, and so on, which define our current moment. And on the basis of a sustained critical examination of where we are, of what is happening to our lives in this global system, we then begin to push out on in and through the contradictions through which we're living to explore how this system might be reconfigured and that's as I say, where, what I'll turn to uh, tomorrow so today I want to offer you as Elizabeth was hinting at an account of where we are in the history of world capitalism in the so-called neoliberal moment and in particular with respect to the world economic crisis that broke in 2008. And if I can do that, I hope to then clear some ground for our discussions tomorrow. And because you've got David Harvey coming later, speaking about dialectical theory, I will begin with a dialectical proposition for you, which is to say, the crisis is over, the crisis continues. And I do that not to be cute, although maybe you'll think it's slightly cute, but I do that because, as the title of my talk suggests, I believe we are living through a sustained series of crises, which is a single social process which is mutating, which is transforming. That is to say, there is an enduring and ongoing crisis which is taking new forms. Now, in dialectical theory, this isn't surprising because we treat entities not as fixed and given, but as inherently dynamic and transformative. And so I'll suggest to you, for instance, that this crisis, which began as a so-called real estate or housing crisis, and then apparently transformed itself into a financial crisis, and over the past several months has taken the form of a sovereign debt crisis, particularly most dramatically in Greece, but I would argue in a much more systemic way, that there is a tendency to see all of these as discrete events. First something happened in housing, then something happened to banks, now something's happening to governments. And my claim is that these are all interrelated moments or aspects of a single social process, which I'm calling the global slump. And in making this claim, I'm suggesting that we are living through the first global and systemic crisis of neoliberal capitalism. And I want to emphasize both aspects. It is not the case that neoliberalism knew no crises until 2008. But the crises up until then were predominantly regional and contained. The crisis that broke overtly in 2008, I'm suggesting, is both global and systemic. Un it is therefore unlike the 
crisis in East Asia in 1997, or the crisis in Brazil and Russia in 1999-98, or the crisis in Argentina in 2000 and 2001. Instead, it is global and systemic, and this represents uh, really something quite novel and incredibly important. By and large, the mainstream commentary is almost hopeless. But the most interesting of the mainstream commentary, in my view, tends to be that which is explicitly non-theoretical and just empirical. It's utterly frustrating because it's nothing but empiricism, but nevertheless, the people who are trying to do the most sustained empirical work on the crisis do recognize it doesn't conform to anything that we have seen in quite some time. So in the best of such studies, for instance, the authors write, this is by the way the book called This Time is Different, the authors write, the global financial crisis of the late 2000 stands as the most serious global financial crisis since the Great Depression. The crisis has been a transformative moment in global economic history whose ultimate resolution will likely reshape politics and economics for at least a generation. And I think that's fundamentally correct. In other words, I do believe the claim that we are living through a transformative moment that is radically redefining the very terrain of economic and political life. In other words, it is a generational shift. A shift in expectations, a shift in the inherent dynamics and capacities of capitalism, uh, and one which will have, as a result, a whole series of uh, associated political effects is, I think, correct. And what's interesting is that this was registered in the mainstream, in the early going, in the crisis. And you can see there are all kinds of symptomatic expressions of the recognition in the early days of the crisis of just how profound this shift was, and in my claim is. If you, for instance, look back uh, through the prism of Hank Paulson's memoirs, quite an interesting document on the brink, uh, by the way, the then uh, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, who as one investment bank on Wall Street after another was collapsing between March and September of 2008, is confiding to the people closest to him, I am deeply scared. And this kind of expression comes over and over throughout this period. You can see it in the gallows humor that emerged on Wall Street as each week brought rumors and ultimately realities of the collapse of all five Wall Street investment banks. Uh, the gallows humor was terrific. I mean, maybe it wasn't so much so if you were an actual Wall Street investment banker, but the jokes were really profoundly revealing. Uh, I'll share with you just my favorite of these, but it goes as follows. How do you start a small business? Buy a big one and wait. <laughs> now, that captures something very, very real that invest, in the investment banking industry was traumatized. A quarter of a million jobs disappeared in 2008 in the financial services industry in the United States, for instance, as this meltdown uh, took place. And I think you see this registered very clearly in the quite interesting series of the Financial Times, I would argue the most important English language business newspaper, the Financial Times of London, that they launched in March of 2009 called The Future of Capitalism. And to read through that series is really intriguing because they, it begins with the proposition, this is a direct quote from memory, the world of the past 30 years is over. And then it raises the question, what will replace it? And really, I want to suggest that all of that, the panic of 2008, the sort of uh, mood that was running through the investment banking industry, and the way in which a journal like the Financial Times was trying to probe what's going on in world capitalism, that all of this speaks to questions that have not disappeared. But this is the one side of my 
claim for a dialectical proposition. The crisis is over if by that people mean that the largest coordinated and sustained intervention by central banks in world history stopped the collapse of the global banking system. That's true, at least for the time being. But we need to realize that this was an intervention on the scale of something in the neighborhood of a $20 trillion injection of funds either directly into the banking system or of stimulus packages. Now, to give you a sense of what that means, we're talking about a coordinated bailout and stimulus program engineered in the period of about six or eight months, equal to about one and a half times U.S. gross domestic product. That is the annual value of all goods and services. Okay? Nothing like this had happened in the history of capitalism. So, to tell me that the crisis is over, first part of the proposition, is simply to tell me that a coordinated injection of wealth into the banking system can prevent the domino effect of bank meltdowns. It can halt it at a certain point. And it's true. It did do that. But it did it simply by way, I'm arguing, of displacing the fault lines of the crisis and moving the fault line into the public sector. Because fundamentally, government sustained a bailout, which has now produced a price tag, which they are trying to absorb by way of a sustained era of assaults on public spending for social programs. And that's something that I will come to shortly. Uh, that is to say, we've now entered, in, initially they were talking about a decade of austerity. What was quite interesting during the G20 meetings in Toronto in late June was that the phrase age of austerity appeared a few times uh, as the recognition that a decade might not be enough began to percolate uh, through the ruling class circles. I'm going to come back to all of that in a moment, but I wanted to set it out that way. In order to give you some sense of the analysis that underpins these claims, I want to step back for a moment and talk about why I am making the argument that this is a global and systemic crisis of neoliberalism, of a whole phase of world capitalism, and why I think it will be a prolonged and sustained one. And here, my analysis begins with a set of claims that are controversial on the left. The, the first of these is that neoliberalism, from a ruling class standpoint, in very important ways worked. That is to say that the neoliberal restructuring of industry, the state, and relations of production on the shop floor actually did produce a sustained quarter-century expansion of the capital system. And this is a controversial claim because there are very important works on the left which argue that since about 1970, global capitalism has been in crisis. I've known this a long downturn, the phrase preferred by Robert Brenner. Uh, there are a variety of particular formulations of it. But one way or another, this proposition is based on the idea that so long as world capitalism does not get itself back to the growth rates of the great boom after the Second World War, 1948 to about 1970, the, both the most sustained global expansion in capitalist history, but also with the highest growth rates. And, and, that it, and the claim tends to be in these quarters that if it does not get back to that sustained process of very high level growth rates, it's in crisis. I tend to disagree with this. I do for several reasons. First, the great boom was exceptional. There is no other period like that right after the Second World War where all of the major capitalist economies grow so dynamically for a period of a quarter century or so. By the way, brackets, I think it took the combined effects of depression and world war to create those possibilities for that kind of 
uh, expansion. But if you do not use the great boom as your benchmark, if you essentially look at the history of capitalism, what you discover is that after the period of recessions from 1973 to 1982, there's basically a decade of recessions during which neoliberalism comes into being. But after the end of the recession that, that comes to a close in 1982, my claim, my argument is that world capitalism enters into about a quarter century long period of expansion. It doesn't mean there are no recessions. It means that it gets out of a major recession every three or four years with dramatic slumps in output and huge jumps in unemployment. That from 1982 to about 2007, the world economy grows in a sustained way, basically triples in size. By the way, if you look at the 30-year period or so, you get a tripling of the global economy. Uh, and in the last phase of this cycle of growth, you get the emergence of an entirely new center of global accumulation, East Asia, predominantly China. You get an entirely new center of world accumulation. We cannot any longer talk about global capitalism without talking about China as a center of accumulation. And that was not true in 1982. So that not only does the world economy triple, but an entirely new accumulation center uh, emerges across this period of time. And as I say, by all historical standards, growth throughout this period is quite robust. If you compare it to, let's say, anything from about 1870 onwards, in terms of the history of capitalism. And so that's the, the, the first part of my, my claim, that there is a neoliberal expansion. It is sustained and it is global. But all periods of expansion are inherently contradictory. Here, I'm completely unoriginal. I truly believe that the claim you get in Marx, which, by the way, has its anticipations and elements of classical political economy, that there is something inherently self-undermining about capitalist growth. That capitalist growth tends to produce slumps, gluts, was one of the favorite terms of the class in classical political economy, that it produces declines, downturns, recessions, that it is inherent in the growth process of capitalism that it does this. I think that proposition is correct and Therefore, it follows that a long wave of expansion is ultimately going to exhaust itself or undermine itself. I believe you get the first signs of that with the East Asian crisis of 1997. That that's the first signal that the most dynamic region during the neoliberal phase of expansion undergoes a great crisis at that point. And this has to do, I believe, with the fact that we're moving towards, once again, by the late 1990s, a classic situation of over-accumulation. That is to say, the build-up of productive capacities, the means of producing goods and services that simply cannot be profitably employed by capital. They have over-accumulated in their hectic, pell-mell, competitive drive to retool, to restructure, to innovate, to expand the forces of production at their command. By 1997, you get the early signs that a, a global overaccumulation crisis is developing. At that point, I believe it is true that financial stimulation postpones and extends, uh, extends the wave of growth and therefore postpones the emergence of a global crisis. I do not believe that the last 30 or 40 years can be explained by financial stimulation alone. I just think the proposition is unsustainable that somehow everything was done by credit for 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I simply do not believe that the world economy can triple and that a whole new accumulation center can emerge simply by the manipulations of the credit system. I think that just un unpersuasive and unconvincing. Uh, proposition. Real accumulation on quite a tremendous scale happened during this period of time. But the credit system did 
from the late 90s on extend the expansion, which otherwise I think would have started to run out of steam. So where I think a lot of the claims for financialization, as it's often used, are true, is clearly in that period. That is to say, great speculative bubbles, so-called asset bubbles, start to form as central banks regularly intervene. They feel the recessionary tendency setting in, and they step in regularly to stimulate the economy, and a variety of bubbles start to emerge. I should say that I do also believe, and I'll just put this out there, won't really be able to pursue this now, I do also think it's the case that there is a structural transformation of capitalism in the neoliberal period that gives specific kinds of financial transactions a much greater significance within the system than ever before. And this, in my view, has to do with the development of an unprecedented form of world money, which is essentially the emergence of world money which no longer has any relationship to a commodity basis. And this happens in 1971, where when any relationship between the US dollar and gold is broken by the Nixon administration in the US, and I think that does create a new financial dynamic where, to put it really crudely, it is possible for central banks to stimulate the economy without the same kinds of constraints that they once had when they were under any kind of gold-based uh, or metallic-based system. So that's just a bracket to say that I do think there's a structural transformation that happens in the whole neoliberal period as well. Okay, but all of that analysis is, is really designed to say that when the crisis breaks in 2008, this is something new in the neoliberal period. The claim that it is the second great contraction since the depression of the 1930s, I think, is correct. That is to say that we are living now through a whole period in which it is going to be extremely difficult for capitalism to get out of a pattern of continuing recessions, slumps, crises of sovereign debt, and so on. And of course, in this respect, I think we need to remind ourselves that although we tend to think about the 1930s as just one big, deep depression, in fact, it itself was highly dynamic in character. You get predominantly downward trend from 1929 to 1933. Then you get a predominantly upward trend from 33 to 37. Then a move back into slump again, so that the fact that we're seeing gyrations and dynamism within what I think is a larger crisis in and of itself should not uh, be any great surprise. Okay, having said all of this, I think I probably need to say a little bit about some of the claims for the end of the crisis. Now, recent financial data has made my job a lot easier when I was making this kind of argument even four or five months ago that, yep, there are recoveries in certain areas, but it, it is not sustainable. Uh, I was greeted with a certain degree of skepticism in a lot of quarters. I think many of you will be aware that more recent data is, in fact, if anything, confirming the kind of argument I'm making. But let me take the sort of stronger case of a few months ago and spend a few minutes on it uh, for you. And I'm going to take a series of headlines which appeared at different points in the summer and talk about them. Uh, the first was one that came out uh, fairly early on, at the beginning of the summer, the really quite systematic profit data for the final quarter of uh, 2009. And it came out with a headline from Thomson Reuters, US corporate profits up 206% in the fourth quarter of 2009. By the way, this was an entirely <coughs> empirically true statement. Uh, but it was not the whole story. Once we begin to analyze the claim, for instance, we discover that when you remove financial enterprises, the 209% jump in profits goes down to 
And if you think about financial enterprises, and you think about 2008, and the massive losses that most of them were taking, a 200% increase is much less impressive than it first sounds. What it tells you is that most of them stopped the bleeding and began to return to profitability. Fair enough. That conforms more or less with uh, the argument I was making. But what's interesting is that the latest data tell us that profits at this point remain well below pre-recession levels. And this, by the way, is atypical in a typical recession. During a so-called normal recession, at this stage of the recovery, profits should have long ago eclipsed the pre-recession level. In fact, we're still well below it. Uh, here was one that uh, people got very excited about for reasons which I'll explain in a moment. U.S. auto sales outpace Canada's. Now, uh, you know, I can only laugh. At, uh, at this one because, of course, you know, since when is the Canadian economy any benchmark for anything? But, uh, of course, it became one simply because, for a variety of reasons I won't bore you with, the Canadian banking industry was not hit as hard as were U.S. and European banks by this crisis. What this had to do with auto sales is a bit obscure uh, in the first instance, but, boy, this headline produced all kinds of excitement. However, again, once we look at it, what we find is it is true that in May, June, and July, U.S. auto sales were increasing at a faster pace than were sales in Canada. But if you take the annual rate they hit, it was 11.5 million cars per year. And some of you who track such things will know that prior to the recession, annual automobile sales in the U.S. were in the 16 to 17 million per year range. In other words, they're about 5 million below the pre-recession norm. At one point, I was spending time on this next one, but I don't think I need to spend uh, too much time on it now. U.S. new home sales make huge jump. Uh, well, that looked good, but the la most recent data, uh, a 27% drop in the sales of existing homes, a 12% drop in the sale of new homes. The fact that one in 10 mortgages in the U.S. is in arrears, that the fastest rising area of uh, delinquent mortgages is the prime mortgage sector, not the subprime, and so on, I think uh, debunks most of that. Again, you get the excitement with every increase in the employment figures, also not very good recently. I'm not going to quibble about the figures for the moment, but I'm going to give you a standard from which to assess the claims about uh, employment figures. Consider this. Simply to restore the jobs lost during the recession would require creating about 8.4 million jobs inside the U.S. economy. Then to create the jobs that demographic growth over the last two years has required, the growth of the population and particularly the employment age population uh, would require about another two and a half million jobs. So you're talking about the need to create something like 11 million jobs to get back to pre-recession levels of employment. Now what that means is that it would require a boom where 400,000 new jobs were created every month for three years to get the U.S. economy back to where it was prior to the recession. And that, by the way, is nearly twice the level of job creation of 2005, which was you know, the last great period of job creation before the slowdown happened. Here's a headline that we don't see very much, and I think it's extremely significant uh, in terms of looking at all of this. The U.S. money supply is contracting and it has been contracting month after month after month, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, for example, which has been publishing very, very good data on this. Commercial and industrial bank loans have fallen every month since October 2008. Now, this is significant. Why? Because we're talking about the real money supply, 
which is to say, in particular, we're talking about the amount of borrowing that businesses are doing to finance new investment. Right now, banks in the U.S. are sitting on a wad of cash, something in the area of $1.3 trillion, just sitting on it, because there is literally no investment demand for it. And this is a symptom when you get the effective money supply, the broad money supply contracting month after month after month, the volume of loans contracting month after month after month. This is a recessionary symptom, and it is why there is a debate happening among economists as to whether deflation is likely to be a problem, because you cannot go for a long period of time with these kinds of figures uh, without that danger uh, emerging. As a result, we get groups like the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development recently releasing a report warning about a so-called lost generation. That's their term. That, and I'm going to come and I'll talk particularly about Europe in, uh, in this regard in, in a few minutes. Let's look at it another way in terms of world capitalism. I think it's fair to say that there are essentially four potential growth centers for the system. There are really four geographic regions where if dynamism was to be regenerated within the world economy, it would have to come from at least one of these regions. And I'm thinking of Europe, Japan, China, the United States. These are the accumulation centers within the world system. Europe, uh, I won't spend a huge amount of time on with you because it's probably the easiest part of the argument. The reality is that good chunks of the Eurozone remain in recession. Greece will contract by about 4% this year. The official unemployment rate in Spain is 20%. Note that's the official unemployment rate is about 20%. In Spain, youth unemployment is moving towards around 40%. In Spain, Ireland is still contracting, and so on. Uh, to give you a sense of the discussion that's happening in uh, Europe at the moment, I will quote you from one uh, article that appeared uh, precisely talking about the spread of austerity across Europe. Uh, this comes from mid-July talking about the, age, the new age of austerity, this particular uh, financial journalist writes, in human terms, it means millions of Europeans who had been given a foothold in the world of property ownership, secure employment, and university education have now been plunged into lives of rented rooms, paltry minimum wage jobs, and dependency on the increasingly feeble state. Many face huge burdens of debt, etc., etc. And note the term, millions. Millions of Europeans are making this transition from the world of home ownership and secure jobs to a world of contracting uh, ex expectations. Japan, again, I don't think anybody who is serious about the state of the global economy, notwithstanding the fact that the yen can periodically bump up for all kinds of short-term uh, speculative reasons, believes that Japan has any capacity to operate as a center of world accumulation. It has completely failed to get out of the crisis that began in the 1990s, remains mired in it. Uh, in fact, in the G20 declaration issued at the end of June in Toronto, where there was a quite interesting claim that now was the time to shift to getting our financial houses in order, i.e. to deficit reduction and to cuts to social programs, Japan was given an escape clause. So bad is the state of the Japanese economy that they were told, well, you can keep stimulating because you're a basket case. And, you know, in terms of real accumulation, I think that's basically correct. As a result, we've had the argument repeatedly that it is China that will lead the way. Sometimes India gets slumped in with China in this argument, and the Indian economy is a weaker version of what I'm about to describe for the, uh, the Chinese, but I'm going to stick with the Chinese because it's the strongest case. And what is true is that China has 
been able to sustain relatively robust growth rates throughout this crisis. <coughs> that, there's no question that that is true. Uh, it has done so by way of a stimulus package which was massively larger in relative terms than the Bush-Obama stimulus package in the US, massively larger. So much so that when you begin to crunch the data, it becomes extremely interesting. Uh, and I was so shocked by some of this that I actually went back and spent some time trying to, to check it. I'm now prepared to say that I think that this data is entirely correct. Uh, during the first three quarters of 2009, when so much of the rest of the economy was struggling to get out of the recession, China was growing. Investment in fixed assets in China, in other words, in the railway system, in new factories, in new roads and airports and so on, accounted for 95% of China's economic growth. Now this is, I mean, literally unprecedented. This is an unbelievable statistic that essentially government-driven investment projects in new steel mills, new railways, new subway lines, new roads, and so on, uh, accounted for 95% of all growth. But what it also meant is if you take, for instance, the steel industry, where China already had, according to its official forecasts, an excess capacity in the area of about 200 million tons of steel per year. In other words, they can produce about 200 million more tons in terms of the capacity of all the steel mills in China than they can sell. They have built another 58 million tons of capacity during this recession. Now the problem is that if I'm the least bit right, that there's an underlying over-accumulation crisis, which is to say a massive expansion of capacity, creation of overcapacity, then all this does is feed the very same problem that the system needs to resolve. And I think this is the paradox of the Chinese growth model at the moment. It is true that China has helped to prevent a deeper crisis overall by sustaining something like 8% growth on the basis of a massive stimulus package. Uh, but the result is huge overaccumulation, and now terms being used like there being a forest. This is again a term from mainstream uh, commentators, a forest of empty shopping malls, empty housing developments, unused steel mills, and so on, all throughout the country. There's enormous debate happening now inside the Chinese government over precisely the sustainability of this growth model. Uh, and right now, those who want to try to slow down the stimulation to start to prevent the buildup of further asset bubbles in the Chinese economy are winning. So they're going to start to bring all these growth rates lower. They're cutting off the supply of credit to oh, businesses that aren't really sustainable and so on. But what that means is, of course, that any stimulative effect the Chinese economy has had is likely to be, if anything, more subdued, not more pronounced. And that then takes me to the US. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but because my theme relates so much to the market and human needs, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about it. And I'm going to start from the quite useful formulation from a mainstream economist uh, writing some months ago who said the United States has a statistical recovery and a human recession. And I think that actually quite nicely captures what has been going on over the last year. There has been a statistical recovery in some areas and a sustained human recession. I would go farther if pushed and say that in fact the human recession makes possible the statistical recovery in some areas, because that human recession, of course, is driven by the ongoing leaning of production by American employers. It resulted in the, throughout 2009, in huge jumps in labor productivity, which simply meant that fewer workers were producing more than ever before. The classic neoliberal methods of leaning production, of squeezing workers in a climate of rising unemployment, and of job insecurity to produce ever more, to get ever more output per hour. 
by the way, there are inherent limits to what is possible simply by squeezing labor in this way without an investment boom where you massively retool production. And I think those limits are being reached at the moment. But in the early stages of the recession, that's uh, precisely what happened. Uh, if, you are to, if you take the real unemployment rate, and by the way, this, this rate was used quite often in the 1930s, which is to say you take all of those people who are out of work and all of those who are working part-time and casual hours but seek full-time employment, you get a real unemployment rate of over 17%, uh, about 27 million people, either unemployed or underemployed in the US economy. And not surprisingly, all of the racialized patterns of the American job market get reproduced within these statistics so that the total on an underemployment rate for black workers is now over 24%. For Latino workers, it's right on about 25%. Four out of every 10 African American workers have been unemployed at some point since the recession began over the two year period uh, plus now. Um, according to The Economist, one in every six workers has taken a wage cut. And if you look at things like food stamps, it, several things are particularly revealing. Not just the enormous growth in the number of people using uh, food stamps, according to Hunger in America 2010, about 37 million people used food stamps last year, which was a 46% uh, jump. But 40% of food stamp recipients are working for a wage. So in other words, you're getting more and more people who are actually working. They're employed, they're in wage labor in some capacity, but unable to make ends meet. Uh, they are officially below the poverty line. And here I want to come back now to some of the dynamics, and this will take me into talking briefly about resistance and alternatives simply in ways that will open up some of the discussion that I hope we can have both uh, this afternoon and, and over the next couple of days. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about all these dynamics now. I said at the beginning before stepping back and running through these various aspects of the, the picture that the latest phase of this mutating crisis is the sovereign debt crisis phase which produced all the headlines in the panic in financial markets about Greece beginning in the late spring and running into the early summer. And fundamentally, what the ruling class is pushing for, but by the way, there's a great internal debate inside the ruling class right now over this, but fundamentally, the predominant line is towards retrenchment and austerity. That the stimulus has to end, the fiscal house has to be brought back into order, and that this means massive cuts in social programs. That's the predominant line. It, by the way, as I said, an exception gets given to Japan in this scenario, and it has to be said that the Obama administration has a quite ambivalent relationship to it. That is to say, they want a kind of combination of austerity with selective and I would argue largely cosmetic stimulus packages uh, for a whole variety of, uh, of overall political reasons. But the G20 communique released in Toronto in June was about austerity. That's fundamentally what it was. That was a consensus that was forged as the leaders of the 20 largest economies in the world met. That was the consensus that they pushed through and they issued it in, uh, in their declaration at the end. Having said that, because austerity is going to produce renewed waves of crisis, it's going to produce jumps in unemployment, drops in output, increases in poverty, and so on, there will also be, I believe, periodic retreats from it by governments who panic about its implications, their political futures, and so on. So that <coughs> while I'm saying that the age of austerity is the predominant trend within ruling class circles. It's important to uh, be clear that I'm talking about it, the, the trend, 
That's the direction that they want, uh, but they have big, big problems because unless you believe the claim that they have restored the conditions for private accumulation on a world scale, i.e., you know, Obama keeps saying, come on, private sector, do your duty, uh, and so far they're not, and my claim is they're not going to in a situation of profound overaccumulation. It's very, very difficult uh, for that scenario to, uh, to kick in. Um, that's the assumption. But given that it won't, given that in fact austerity deepens the crisis and deepens the recessionary tendencies, you will see big debates flaring up from time to time in ruling class circles, and you'll see governments that gyrate and vacillate uh, over exa exactly where they're going. As a result, I'm going to claim that what we now have is a period of a kind of mutant neoliberalism. And what I mean by that is that neoliberalism's great claim when it came into being in a codified programmatic fashion in the 1970s was that it had a program for restoring growth. That the winding down of the great boom was precisely due to the loss of market discipline. And therefore market discipline had to be recreated. And this meant rolling back social programs, weakening unions, creating much more favorable climate for business. And then did they succeed in doing that? The problem for them now is that neoliberal methods have no capacity in the next period to restore growth. And that's a very, very serious problem for them. If they were to take us through a decade-long process with several deep slumps which destroyed inefficient capital, which by the way is what they did do between 73 and 82, particularly in the United States, the recession of 80 to 82 was crucial in this regard, and just in terms of bankrupting all kinds of steel companies, inducing a whole new wave of restructuring and so on. A decade of deep slumps and crises and restructuring could get us there. But neoliberal nostrums can't. And so this is going to be the problem for them, that in any kind of short term, their medicine means a deeper slump. And that's why, as I say, there will be uh, moves back from it. I think to give you a sense of what it means, we could summarize it by way of saying that with this global crisis, structural adjustment has come to the global north in a sustained way. Where a structural adjustment was predominantly a feature of life in the global south throughout the neoliberal period, it's now coming to the north. And just you know, to give you some sense of what that means, begin at the periphery. Latvia has now fired one third of all teachers. Just gone. 20% of all public employees have been dismissed. Those who remain have had their wages cut by 25%. Moving closer to the European core, uh, Ireland. 10% have been cut from child benefits, 22.5% from the wages of public sector workers, 4% from welfare rates, and so on. Greece. Pensions have been effectively cut in half. I don't think I need to tell people here about the scale of the cuts in places like California, where you've got over a billion dollars coming out of uh, social programs. And if you take Britain, prior to the most recent budget, which probably moved in a more rapid way towards austerity than many commentators expected, the Institute for Fiscal Studies estimated that by 2017, the average British family, okay, by 2017, would be $4,500 poorer than they are today as a result of reductions in real income, tax increases, cuts to social programs, and so on. So this is what the age of austerity translates into. As a result, you get... Um, <coughs> One of the columnists that I love to hate uh, in the New York Times, Thomas Friedman, uh, writing on Sunday, today, talking about America now, today and for the next decade at least, 
being a leader in America will mean, on balance, taking things away from people. And that formulation, taking things away from people, I think is, you know, really just encapsulates what I'm getting at. This is why it's a mutant neoliberalism. It's a neoliberalism which cannot even make promises of, in, you know, in any kind of convincing way, promises of prosperity. The great claim of neoliberalism, that they had a growth model, which was key to its success, is a huge problem now. As a result, you get a mean, nasty neoliberalism without all of the great rhetoric about freedom and prosperity. It's just sure, simple, mean-spiritedness imposed with fatalistic claims. Not great, uplifting claims about freedom and prosperity. Not crack out your Hayek and your Milton Friedman. Uh, this is simply grin and bear it, folks, because there is no other way of getting our system back on its feet. That's the, uh, the kind of claim that, uh, that we're talking about. I should also say that in this period, it seems to me almost irrefutable that migrant workers have moved to the forefront of the line of attack. That is to say, if in literally every region of world capitalism today, Migrant workers are the ones who are bearing the initial brunt of the deepest kinds of attacks. Whether we're talking about Arizona, whether we're talking about the use of the temporary foreign worker program in Canada, whether we're talking about the rural migrant workers in China, 25 million of whom were sent back to the countryside when the crisis first hit because they do not have long-term rights to live or to social benefits in the cities. They are internal migrants in the classic sense, whether we're talking about migrant labor in countries like France or Germany, or for that matter, in places like Dubai or South Korea. Uh, that in many respects, I think that for the left, the defense of migrant workers, the arguments, whether it's the movement of the sans-papier, those without papers, without documents in France, groups like No One Is Illegal in Toronto where I am or what have you, these fights around the rights of migrant workers have moved to the forefront, I think, of every uh, authentically left agenda. And let me, with that in mind, because I'm rapidly running out of time, just make a, a few final comments which may help to set up some of the discussion that we'll, we'll now get into and that we'll have in the next couple of days. I don't want to end without emphasizing that this crisis has induced a wave of working class resistance, but it is a wave of working class resistance which has been sporadic, fragmented, uncoordinated and largely, there are important exceptions, but largely incapable of posing sustained political alternatives. Okay. But if you take, for instance, the fact that very early on in the crisis, we got a wave of factory occupations, the largest in a very, very long time, beginning with the occupation of Republic windows and doors in Chicago and extending through the occupation of automobile plants, auto parts plants in particular uh, in Canada, of a whole series of plants in Ireland and in Britain and Scotland, uh, the boss snappings which took place in France, okay, factory occupations aren't good enough, fine, we'll take the boss too. Uh, and by the way, in some cases in France, that was more successful, the boss snapping technique, than just occupying the plant. Um, huge wave of strikes and factory occupations in South Korea in the early going. And in some cases, much, much higher levels of social protest and social mobilization. Uh, for me, I think the most important and significant until the great protests in Greece that began, particularly in the spring of uh, this year, were the general strikes in Martinique and Guadeloupe. Uh, these were massive uprisings of the working class populations, general strikes organized by the trade unions, but with very, very large coalitions 
bringing in students, mm -hmm. pensioners, the unemployed, and so on. Uh, for me, the Guadalupe Coalition just had the most wonderful title. I mean, I, you know, I would just, in, I'll instantly join anytime anybody creates a coalition called this. Uh, because, mind you, you're also talking about something involving about 100 social organizations and trade unions calling itself during the 44-day long general strike, the Coalition Against Exploitation. Uh, and uh, it seemed pretty good, if, uh, if you ask me. Um, and amazingly, they did uh, win a 200 euro a month increase for the lowest paid workers. This was a really quite dramatic upheaval in early 2009 in both of these two French neo-colonies. Uh, I, and I want to emphasize, I think there have been a variety of very, very important kinds of mobilizations, most significantly in recent months in Greece, I mean, very, very large general strikes and social protests, but I think it has to be said that these are, have, have developed in a context in which the damage of the prolonged period of neoliberalism to the working class movement, to the left, to radical parties and movements and so on has been so significant that it has been very, very difficult to recuperate and to recover uh, by and large. And as a result, we're really talking, I think, not about a kind of instant rebirth of serious socialist politics in response to the crisis, but much more going back to the quote that I began with, if we're talking about a transformative moment that will shape politics for a generation, that's really the, the way in which we have to be thinking. That the decade or age of austerity will also have to be, I think, for those of us who see what it means, a, imagined as a decade of rebuilding the left. And cre recreating a left which can meaningfully speak to the concerns of much, much larger constituencies of working class people and begin to mobilize those constituencies in much more sustained ways. And what I hope to do in the discussion tomorrow is talk about some of the uh, political visions that can inform that in various ways. But I'm going to stop here because you've been incredibly generous listening to me go on for much longer than I should have. Uh, and I thank you for your indulgence.